uh, it, really, things, things are exciting. One of the things that we talked about when Jill and I and the family first moved up here was the desire for this congregation to move a lot of their ministry off this campus. Tremendous amount of stuff happens here, and that's great. But we want the church without walls. Amen? What a, a great opportunity to have this building dropped into our lap in this past year and to have not only the, the learning center there, but our disaster relief trailers and uh, what, what's happening with, with the mercy ministry and now Jobs for Life. You don't have to search. If you want to get involved in the community, this church, if it were not here, is starting to be, would be missed. Amen? God has given us an opportunity. Please, we need workers for all of those ministries. Uh, boy, uh, and we, we need a leadership team to surround Ken because this is an incredible opportunity to make a difference. In January 2004, we were making plans for the Soul Link Youth Rally, and it was an annual event that took place at our church in, in Houston with about 1,400 teens would come to invade. It, it was kind of a scary proposition. But un unlike other youth rallies where uh, you, you just brought in speakers and, and talent and stuff to kind of run the rally, uh, we actually tried to grab some of the teens that were going to be at the rally and involve them in some different activities before the rally, and then we shot video of it, and then we'd show it at the rally so that the teens felt more a part of, of the programming. And in 2004, the theme that we chose was God's Amazing Race, based off the television show, The Amazing Race, not real original, but the idea was to take 12 plugged-in youth leaders from different youth programs around the state of Texas, and we put them on, on, uh, on teams of, of three, so four teams of three, and we send them to different parts of the country. Unlike the show where they're all racing from one destination to another, we send them at different places, and then they had three days to get back to Houston. So we flew some out to L.A., we flew some to Chicago, and, and the whole time I'm thinking, why are these parents all trusting us with their kids to do these things? Well, we sent some out to L.A., some to Chicago, some to Atlanta, and then the group that I was filming and serving as a chaperone on, we were out in Jacksonville, Florida. And they weren't just traveling, trying to get back, they had different things along the way, so they had four or five challenges. Like, one of the first challenges that we had, once we, we got off, uh, and got, got our airline tickets and told where we're going. We didn't even know where we're going. The first challenge was to go to the Children's Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida, and work with the students in the cancer ward. And then after we were done, the, the person in the cancer ward had uh, the next challenge for us, and we had to make our way um, by, by bus over to Pensacola, Florida, and start working in, in a soup kitchen for a day. At the end of that, we, we received from the, the lady that ran the soup kitchen in Pensacola our next challenge. And the challenge was for us to share our faith with someone on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. And some, the, everyone's all saying, oh, I ignore, I ignore New Orleans. And then I got to thinking, well, the guy that put these challenges together was not a, exactly a big sports fan. And what he didn't realize is, is that he was sending us into New Orleans without really a game plan on the night before the BCS championship game between LSU and, and OU there at the Sugar Dome. So this place, New Orleans, the Big Easy, was packed. So we show up on an Amtrak train that we took from Pensacola over, got there about 10 o'clock at night, and it was freezing. It was in the high 30s, and temperatures were falling. And we had no place to stay. And, and in fact, there was not a hotel room available. So we're cut loose, and our, our tickets to hop on the Greyhound from New Orleans into um, Houston the next day didn't leave till the next morning. So we had to survive the night in the cold. And so I put a phone call into one of my buddies on the Soul Link board. And I said, this is our situation. You know, this guy has put us in here. Well, I don't have a clue. Help us out. And so he said, you go do your thing, and I'll see what I can do. And so we walked over to, in, into the French Quarter and made our way over to Bourbon Street and, and shared the, the, the saving message of Jesus to various people in different stages of inebriation. And, and, and tried to talk with him about Jesus. So we're doing this for a couple of hours, and then I got a phone call about midnight, and he said, I've got a place for you. Here's the address. So I didn't know if it was some shady motel, what, what it was. But it turned out as a side street just off Bourbon Street. And so we went and knocked on the door, and there was a caretaker there, and he invited our, our group to come inside. 
And so this was a gorgeous three-bedroom apartment right on that the, that the, the doors opened up in the balcony uh, onto Bourbon Street. And so you could walk out on the balcony and see the sea of humanity that was out there. And th- this was a beautiful apartment, professionally decorated, 12-foot high ceilings, just incredible. And after the caretaker let us in, he, he left and, and went and got some snacks for the night and also some breakfast foods for in the morning. So this was a very difficult time for us. And th- this was something we had no idea how we were to get through this jam. But it, it, was, it, it was a time when we felt like that... There was nothing we could do for a situation, but someone that we didn't know came in and bailed us out of of a tough jam. And it was all free of charge. So how did I respond to this gift of of generosity and and rescuing us in time of need? Well, I I wrote them a a thank you card, and I I found out that the family that that owned this place owned a series of of car dealerships in the north part of, of Houston. And so later that year, when it was time for me to buy a truck, I went to the Toyota place that, that their family owned and bought a truck from them. And so here, here's the thing. I, I really feel like that I was responding out of generosity. But I, I still have not met this benefactor family. They don't know me, and I don't know them, but yet they helped me. But it was kind of a one-time deal. And I'll, I, man, I'm, I'll remember them, be grateful but that's pretty much it. We do not have a relationship. And I, I got to thinking this week, I, I wonder if we kind of refla- reframed our relationship with Jesus in a similar way, in that when we understand about our sin, we're in a jam, there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, Jesus is there to rescue us. And so it becomes this one-time event. And so if you talk to people about their, their faith, a lot of them will tell about their come-to-Jesus moment. And so you say, what, what's going on in, in your life? Well, let me tell you about my testimony. This is who I used to be, and this is who I am now. And, and Paul talks about that in, in Scripture. He talks about his road to Damascus. Early on in his preaching, that's what he shared about, was his come-to-Jesus moment. But after that, well, he starts writing about his struggles and starts talking about sin and and, and how he can put to death this old man. And then he starts talking about being shipwrecked, what God's done here and there. And yet sometimes we just talk about our our faith relationship with God as a one-time deal. Within the Church of Christ, we we talk about the the day that we were baptized. And and so we, we start framing it in this way. Scott McKnight, in his book, The King Jesus Gospel, makes the case that the gospel... Well, the good news of Jesus has been reduced from God's story that's been going from the beginning of time all throughout history to merely just a plan of salvation. Some of y'all are like, what's wrong with the plan of salvation? I mean, we we grew up in this, didn't we? I mean, those of you who were raised in the Church of Christ. So help me out. What were the five steps to salvation? What was the first one? Yell it out. Here. Okay, Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes from hearing the message And the message is heard through the work of Christ. The second one was what? Believe. John 6, 29. The work of God is this, to believe the one he has sent. Third one? Repent. Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent then, turn to God, so your sins may be wiped out. Next one? Confess. Matthew 10, 32. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men... Him will I also confess before my Father who's in heaven. Last one, a big one, be baptized. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. It's part of Mark's version of the Great Commission. But whoever does not believe will be contemned. And so I got to looking online at different Church Christ websites and stuff. There was actually another one that had a few more steps in here. Let's see if we can see that one. And so you have God's part and then man's part. So God's part is God sent his son Jesus. Uh, What was Jesus' life all about? Well, he died and shed his blood. And so the Spirit came in as part of the Trinity to reveal God's word. And then pretty much he's been retired ever since. But that's another lesson for another day. So there's God's part. And then our response is the five we just went through. And then they added one more, which is just to remain faithful. And, And we wait. We wait for our salvation. We wait for heaven. So this is what the Christian life 
it is summed up. What must I do to become saved? Okay? Well, in, in both the Augsburg Confession, that's kind of how we got there, put together by the Lutheran Protestants, and the G Geneva Confession that was written by John Calvin and another guy, that these Reformation leaders were trying to distinguish their beliefs from some of the Catholic doctrine that they were rebelling against. And so they're, they're putting together this, this new way of looking at things, and they begin to look at the gospel message as a system of salvation. How do you go from being unsaved or, or lost to being saved? But in doing so, some feel that the Protestant movement began diminishing the living with Christ. That's the whole discipleship part of, of, of living and in, in, in becoming a Christian in order to elevate the correct pathway to salvation. Contemporary evangelicals, especially here in the States, have kind of bought into this view of, of the gospel as this, it's, it's a way for lost people to become saved. McKnight shares that the current gospel message has been reduced to four points. God loves you. You're messed up. Jesus died for you. And if you accept him, no matter what, you get to go to heaven. And so that's kind of what's going on. And that's, that's, a, that's the message that's being preached and, and proclaimed out there in, in Christendom. And, and so that's what's kind of going on. So God's Son comes down and, and personally fills your heart and you go about life from this point on carrying your personal Jesus with you. In fact, uh, back in the, the 90s, you had the baby on board thing, a little, little stuck up in, in your car, the, the back. I, I don't know what that was there. Uh, don't ram me. I've got a baby on board. Don't know what it was. But then the, the Christians kind of put one that said Jesus on board. So you've got Jesus that goes with you. So whatever your life is going to be, Jesus is, is now a part of that. And he's, he's with you. And if you were born pre-1971, you went in as a child and you got the, the smallpox vaccine. And, it, and do you remember this? And, and so uh, people that, that are older have this little scar right here on their left arm. Um, and, and so, in essence, we kind of look at this one-time transaction. It's like getting inoculated. Inoculated from sin, and inoculated from the devil. No longer is that something we worry about because we've had this one experience, the salvation moment with Jesus. And, and really, life is just whatever you want it to be after that time. It's just this one-time transaction between you and God. And so the rest of your life, we're just called to be good, and kind of wait for heaven to come. In his book, The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard calls this reduction of the story of Jesus as the gospel of sin management. The idea presumes a Christ with no serious work other than redeeming humankind and fosters vampire Christians who only want a little blood for their sins but nothing more to do with Jesus until heaven. Let that sink in. It, is that what we've reduced the Christian life to? We, we talk with, with our kids, we, we talk with those that weren't raised in the church, and, and we point them to the baptistry. And, we say, and, and that becomes the pinnacle. And then after baptism, we just kind of be good and, and wait. We remain faithful. Is that what we're called to do? But we kind of see this going on in America, don't we? 74% of, of all Americans claim some type of a connection with Jesus. But yet, if you look, very few demonstrate the fruit of a Christ-filled life. There has to be a difference there. It, it's, it's not just managing our sin. It is calling us to a whole new way of being a person. The, the old man dies and a new man comes in his place. Well, how do we avoid this pitfall that's being described by these two authors? Simply this, we need to put Jesus, take him out of our car, and, and Jesus on board with us, put him back into his original story. Put him into the context of God's meta-narrative, the grand story to see what God has been up to all throughout Scripture and value the Old Testament to see what God did with his chosen people, to see how we 
play into that and see what God has in store for us. And once we understand the role that's played by Christ, we too can pick up our crosses and begin to follow him. So let's look at just a few highlights from this grand story. For those living in the first century, the gospel was the story of Jesus Christ, not just this guy that was dropped out of the sky, but in, in, in essence, the completion of the story of Israel as found in Scripture. So from the very beginning, in, in Genesis chapter 1, we see God created man for a reason. God created man to be an image bearer, to where if people saw man and see men that are sold out in him, you get an image of the one that created him. And so it, it wasn't just that he had dominion over the animals and over the fish and the birds and the air. He also had a role and a responsibility, a unique connection that the other animals didn't have. And so that's what's so tragic in, in, in the fall. It's not just that, that they sinned and, and chose to partake of this fruit. It was that they were relinquishing the role God had for them as image bearers, but also giving up on the relationship. So the first thing that happens is man gets put outside the garden. Well, the, the second person that, that kind of comes in that was key to understanding was Abraham and, and his call to be the father of this great nation. And, and the Jews were going to be this favored people, not just because God liked them better. They took on a role as a holy people, a people to be image bearers of the one that was blessing them. And so they had a special knowledge and were going to live life according to that. And God was going to do some incredible things through this people so that all nations would come and say, we want to be like you. In some ways, they, they did some of these things. Uh, other times, sin distracted them. And eventually, these people, God's chosen people, are enslaved in Egypt. So the next major character that comes in is Moses, who's not only the deliverer of God's people, but he is the one to receive the law on Sinai. And so God says, I'm going to rescue you first and demonstrate my love that I have for you. And then let me take you up to Sinai. Let me give you my law. Let me tell you about this relationship that I want to have as your God and my people. And so they prepare them. So for 40 years, they go back and forth. Finally, they're ready to go into the promised land. But it said once they got there, even though God warned them, they forgot the father that had been blessing them. And each man turned away from the law and kind of did as he saw fit. So God sent in the judges. He sent in the prophets. And, and finally, the kings, and the, the one that, that's the highlight on here was King David, a man after God's own heart. And, and David has some success of being this image bearer and, and showing the true heart and, and of, of his heavenly father that he had spent so much time with. But even David slipped up, and, and David had a time where he was distracted, and David had a time where he walked away from what he knew was right. And things begin to unravel quickly with Solomon, then the divided kingdom, and then the people getting into all kinds of idolatry. And suddenly God's holy people, it says, in many ways, they're worse than the pagans around them, and they're taken off into captivity. And as we come into the story of Jesus, the people are looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the king of the lineage of David to be this person to finally not only rescue God's people, but to be this image bearer, to be this one that's going to do things right. And so that's what God is, is calling them to. And so that's what, what God is, 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 is telling them in the gospel message. Jesus is this Messiah. We read earlier in the account of Jesus' baptism. And we, we have to realize that this is a very crucial event in our understanding of discipleship. Because when Jesus steps into the waters of the Jordan, the murky waters of the Jordan, three things happen simultaneously that, that are crucial as we understand and, and come alongside and become disciples of Jesus. The first thing is, is that he humbled himself. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about Naaman who didn't want to walk down because he was the commander of this great army. He's like, I don't want to walk down in those murky waters. Imagine how humbling it must have been 
for, for the Son of God to allow a mere mortal, even if it was his cousin John the Baptist, to baptize him in this humble position before the crowd. But Philippians 2, verse 7 and 8 says, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to hold on to, but instead made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself, and so he says, I have every right to be up on the throne next to God, but instead I'm going to release that in order to do something incredible that God's calling me to. So he humbled himself. Not only did he humble himself, number two, he became obedient. So the assignment that God has given to Adam, that Adam failed at, it was passed on to Abraham and, and God's people, and then on to Moses and, and, and later to David, he's now going to grab a hold of that role and say, God, I'm going to give you everything. My, my father is going to be not my will, but, but yours. And so we're finally, finally going to see with clarity the picture of our Heavenly Father through His Son living a perfect life. And this is going to be difficult, but Jesus Himself will have to die to Himself in order to become this Messiah, to be Emmanuel, God with us, and to do what all others, including the law, failed to live up to. The third thing that Jesus did was His life was given for others. You know, N.T. Wright states that it was at this moment when, when Jesus walks into the waters that he receives his calling. And that if he had already had knowledge of this calling, it was confirmed as he walked into the waters. He knows he's going to have to humble himself. He knows it's a call to obedience. And he knows as he walks in there that it's no longer about him. It's about caring for others. And so he has this unwavering obedience to his father. Well, how far does this obedience go? The text tells us that he went even to the cross. You know, Jesus didn't need to be baptized. In a lot of ways, he did. He's setting a pattern for us, a pattern of complete humility for us. But he desired to submit to God more than he desired to have any honor bestowed upon him. And everything he did, including his walk to Calvary, was for us. Once we understand that, then we don't look at scriptures as just a, a pattern to help us with salvation, saying, well, we're lost. We don't want to go to hell. We don't want to go to heaven. How do we do that? Well, you go here, and then you go here, you go here, here. No, let's look at God's story. Let's look at the story that Jesus put into, and then let's say what's our part as we hop into the story with him. Because as long as we keep Jesus at arm's length, we're never going to experience the power. We're never going to experience the promises that God gave to his son that get passed on to us. So what's our response? Paul talks in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 15. Therefore, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. So you've got this incredible vision of who Jesus is that Paul lays out in the Christ poem. He said, let me tell you how incredible what he's done. He doesn't follow that up with now. Because of that, you can do this, this, and this, and you'll be saved and be with him. No, he follows up the magnificent story of who Jesus is to a call of depravity, a call of discipleship, a, not a path to salvation, but a, con, a call to continue growing in Christ, to become like Christ for the sake of this world. It's so important that we pick up the banner to become image bearers. And that can't happen unless we're becoming more and more like Christ. Because unlike Christ, those that went before him, we become this thing that, that is, is not quite showing who Jesus is. But through the power of the Spirit, we become more and more like Christ. And we point others to him. How do we do that? See if these sound familiar. Number one, humble yourself. 
You know, when I come across an arrogant person that you meet in person or on television, my first thought is when, when I encounter them is they don't really know God. They, they don't. Because the people that really knew God and spent time with Him were able to enter into His presence in a dialogue. I think of folks like Moses. I think of Isaiah and Job. And those that got a clear picture of who John who, who God was, well, Job got little bitty and God got huge. Those that are arrogant have it flipped. You know, I spent some time in, in education, and I, I have to tell you that the further that I went in my education, the more I realized how little I knew about a ton of stuff. And, and, and I thought I would get smarter, but in fact... It, it didn't help me. It made me go the opposite direction. And in fact, the time when I was smartest in my life was when I was a senior in high school. I knew it all. And, and no one needed to teach me anything. I think sometimes some early walk with, with God still had a lot of, of me in it. Some of you say it's still there. I know I'm trying to put it together. But the, the more we come into the presence of God, the more we see how His ways, His ideas, his path, his way of doing life is so much bigger and such a, a, a bigger story than what America has to offer and the American dream. God's calling us to so much more. And he, he's calling us to this idea that we have to humble ourselves. I have to tell you, baptism is a humbling experience. To confess that you have a need before God that you can't do anything about. We talked with our, our fourth and fifth graders on Wednesday night. We're, we're talking about um, some good things that we see in Scripture and some bad things we see in Scripture. I said, if you've done both, can you kind of tip the scale by doing a few more good things to kind of outweigh some of the bad stuff? And ask them to raise their hands. And about half said, well, yeah, you just kind of do a few more good things. No, we can't do anything to make ourselves right with God. That is through the gift of Jesus Christ. That's what we're calling us to. God's calling us to obedience. And God's calling us to this humbling experience. And baptism is a sign, it's a pledge of good conscience towards God that you're indeed going to live for Him. The second thing is become obedient, not just in our baptism, but looking at scriptures and saying, I'm not there, but it's going to be a lifelong pursuit that I want to put the old man to death and, and live for God in all aspects of my life. And I, I have to tell you, that if you start receiving promptings of the Spirit, I know that sounds scary, but God puts upon your heart some things, your old man is going to try to pull you back, say, don't go there, that's scary, that, that's not safe. That, that's exactly, God wants you to come over here and allow him to do that, to be obedient to what he's calling us to. And we, at that point, begin to join God's story and start carving out a little place in our hearts for Jesus in our story. It's a huge paradigm shift that, that's different. And finally, we give, you give your life for others. You know, there's nothing more unappealing being around self-centered people. God's calling us to break the mold, to be different, and to be about other people. Last week, I was at uh, soccer practice, and Colby was out there on the field, so we had a little over an hour, and I got a text from, from one of the folks that's been visiting here for a while and was asking some different questions. And after about 30 minutes of texting back and forth, he just said, I, I, I feel like I shouldn't be doing that. that I shouldn't be monopolizing the, the time of, of the preacher at the church. I'm like, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to serve other people. And I, I, I really hope that you can get to that point. And it, it's hard. It's, it's hard for me because it's not easy. Sometimes it's messy. But there's nothing more rewarding than, than knowing that God is using you to help other people and to draw them into a closer relationship with Jesus. So I hope all of us, myself included, can make more and more our lives about other people. But we can't do these things unless we're willing to die to self. We, we can't because we try to protect ourselves, we try to protect our family, we try to protect our time. But the choice is yours today. We can just add a little Jesus into our lives. And, 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 and like that family that, that bailed us out in New Orleans, we, we can be appreciative to what God has done for us, or we can begin this transformation process, start this relationship. God is calling you to more this morning.
If you haven't been baptized, now's the time to humble yourself, to, to come up here and say, this is not the peak of our relationship, it's the beginning of my relationship. And if, if you've already done that and you haven't been living obediently to what God's calling us to, maybe it's, it's a time as we offer an invitation to come down and say, I want to, I want to really rededicate my life to living for Jesus. I, I want to live obediently. I want to live for him. And, and maybe you've done those two things, but it's been kind of an internal thing, and you want to come down. We, we'd love to pray for you that God opened your eyes to ministry, to being active and involved in other people's lives off this campus to make a difference for this community. Whatever your needs are, move. Continue to become more and more like Jesus. And all over. That, that, that's what we're calling us to, to become true disciples of Jesus Christ. If you have a need this morning, come now as we stand, as we sing. Above all powers, above all kings.